scripture reading for this morning comes from Mark's Gospel, the 14th chapter, verses 32 through 42. And they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Lord, we come and we humbly bow before your word. May we take it into our hearts. Use your spirit to speak to us that your words would come in and transform us through the power of that spirit. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Um, this passage is set in the context of everything that happened at the Passover meal that we talked about last week. You remember that? Jesus there, he changes the liturgy. He establishes a new covenant. He broke the bread, and instead of saying the traditional blessing that was with the Passover meal, he said, take, eat, this is my body. In other words, he's saying, I am the Passover lamb. I am the Passover lamb. And then he breaks the uh, tradition of the Passover meal, the Passover liturgy again, when he says, this is my blood. He takes the cup and he says, this is my blood, which is, uh, the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. In other words, no longer did the cup stand for the blood of the lamb that was slain and its blood was uh, smeared or on the doorpost and the lintels of the home. It was his blood. He's saying, I am the Passover lamb. I am the substitute for sin. I am the one that will face death for all those who put, place their faith and trust for, in me. I am the once and for all sacrifice for sin. And he, on, on, the, on the next day, he will give his body, he will give his blood as a ransom for the souls of men and women. And then Jesus tells them, one of you will betray me. I will be betrayed into the hands of sinful men. He says, all of you will fall away. And what does Peter do? He says, well, these characters, these other uh, guys, they might fall away, but I won't fall away. That's not going to happen. I never will do that. Well, then beginning in verse 32, we see how all of this plays out. We see how it all happens. In verse 32, they leave the upper room and they go out to a place called Gethsemane. Uh, that's where they go. Gethsemane is just an oil press. It's there. It's, that's what the word means. They're going out to the Mount of Olives in an olive grove. There's an oil press there to press the olives, get the oil, and use it and sell it for all of, the, all of the things that they used and used that for. And there's a garden nearby there. That's the Garden of Gethsemane. And John tells us in his gospel, I think it's the 18th chapter, that they used to go there often. Go there often. And he tells them, sit here while I pray. And then in verse 33, you know, he takes, uh, he takes the 11, sit here while I pray. And then he takes out Peter, James, and John. They go a little further. And he tells them that I am distressed. I am greatly troubled. 
you stay here and he goes. I think it's Luke that says about a stone's throw away. You know, some of us can throw a rock farther than others, so you take your best guess at how far away he was, maybe 30 yards or so away from them. And he tells them to stay there. So we have this contrast. We have this juxtaposition if we go back to the context of the Passover meal. Jesus sits in that meal and he calmly tells them, somebody's going to betray me. You're all going to forsake me. Uh, the, he quotes Zechariah 13, the, the uh, shepherd, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And with the full knowledge of all that, that he is the one that will be struck and that they are the sheep that will be scattered. This same Jesus, he comes to Gethsemane and he calls his three closest disciples to him to give him support and they go to sleep. But anyway, uh, he calls them close to him and then he says, that he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. What happened on the walk from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane? What's happening? Why is Jesus, who was so calm, suddenly stressed out? Why is he so troubled? I mean, he's been saying it all along, hasn't he, that this is exactly what would happen, that he would be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, and he would be crucified, and he would... Uh, die, be dead, be buried, and rise again. This is exactly what's going on. So why is he so upset if he knows the plan? And isn't he God? I mean, he's God in human flesh. Shouldn't he just be calm and cool in the face of all this? Why so much drama, Jesus? What's going on? And I think we can understand it better if we look at it in light of the last time Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him on a field trip. You remember when that was? Way back 100,000 years ago in Mark chapter 9. They went up to the Mount of Transfiguration. And there, there Peter, James, and John got a glimpse of his deity. And now they go, he takes them to the garden. And they don't see his deity. They catch a picture of his humanity. A picture of his humanity. Uh, and there are lots of pictures of Jesus given to us in the Gospels, aren't there? There's pictures of Jesus taking the children in his arms and blessing them. Jesus on the donkey riding into Jerusalem while people shout the Psalms of Ascent to him. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. There's the picture of him as he cleanses the temple and he overturns the uh, money changers' tables and he says to them, my father's house is a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves, a den of of robbers. And then there's the most recent picture that we have of Jesus, if you will, serving communion in the upper room. But none of those pictures come close to what we see here. Nothing comes close to it. We're introduced to a Jesus that's in distress. And let's be sure, he's, uh, this isn't taking him by surprise. You know, he knows it. He knows that he is the one that will uh, die in the place of sinners. And we see, because he says it plainly in John's gospel, he says, for this purpose have I come to this hour. This is why I'm here. And he has consistently uh, repeated the divine necessity of his suffering. And now he's faced, though, with the imminent prospect of the ordeal. And I thought about that, and it's probably a bad comparison, but it, it's kind of like facing surgery. Kind of like facing surgery, in a way. A lot of you have had the experience, you know, the date is set. You know it's coming, but it's, it's down the road. <laughs> and you don't think about it. Then you have to go to pre-op. I'm going to remind you of what's going on. But it's still down the road a ways. It gets a little more real, but it's just still, you had a date on your calendar. But then the time comes, and it's the night before, and it's a little bit hard to sleep. You wake up the next morning and your mouth's dry, and they won't let you drink anything. <laughs> you know, you you're, uh, you got have that cotton mouth, and uh, your heart might beat a little faster. And, and the point is, is there's a big difference between knowing it's coming and then when it arrives. There's a big difference, and that's what's changed for Jesus. But we still ask ourselves, well, he's, he's God. He's God in human flesh. Uh, shouldn't he have faced this hour in his life differently, more calmly? I mean, we know people that face uh, their deaths more calmly. Why can't Jesus do this more calmly? Why so distressed? Why so troubled? Well, 
here's where you're going to have to need to understand just a little bit. I promise it's just a little bit. When people hear these two words together, systematic and theology, their brain just clicks off and think, I can't think that way. But yeah, you can. You guys are intelligent folks. You can do that. And I promise it's just a little bit. Okay? Because if we're going to get a fuller grasp of this picture, that it's got to be in HD, if you will. We have to understand who Jesus is a little more clearly. We have to grasp his deity and his humanity. And it's vitally important that we do this because every heresy within the church, and in, even to this day, but and in the early church, swirls around the deity and the humanity of Christ. How do you define that? If you swing too far over to his deity, you fall into some... To, to heresies, and if you swing too far over to his humanity, there are other heresies that come up. And, and then there are people who try to put them to those two things in the blender and mix them up. And if you do that, that's heresy as well. And if you know your, uh, any systematic theology at all, all you have to do is watch the Trinity Broadcasting Network and the heresies flow forth on cable TV. So we have to understand these things. Uh, now, you can rest assured, you can be calm, that I'm not going to talk about every heresy or every ism, docism, Gnosticism, or all those other $64 words that I had to learn in seminary. But we're just going to spend a few minutes, we're going to try to get to the conclusion of it. Just for a moment, we're going to see what the theologians of the early church, what the conclusions were that they came to about Christ. And let's remind ourselves, first of all, that the scriptures are clear. The Bible is clear. God in Jesus Christ became a man. The creator became the created. The eternal one entered into time. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The infinite became finite. The, visible, the invisible became visible. And that's what's happening here. And if you have trouble understanding that, you're in good company. Okay? You're in very good company, the company of the apostles, the company of the fathers and founders of the early church. It took them over 400 years to come to some sort of conclusion on all of this. It wasn't until the council of what's called the Council of Chalcedon in 451 that they made some definitive statements about the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ. Okay, so here we go. They said that Jesus, as God incarnate, as God in human flesh, it did not re relinquish his deity. In other words, instead he added to it. In other words, what they were wrestling with and what we're wrestling with this morning is this. Jesus of Nazareth has, uh, was in fact one person with two natures within him. A divine nature and a human nature. He's very God and he's very man. And they said that he was so unchangeably, indivisibly, and inseparably. Now, before your eyes completely glaze over, what does that mean, right? It means that in the person of Jesus, there are two perfect and distinct natures, and they are inseparably joined together. That's, that's the indivisible part or inseparable part, inseparably joined together. The divine is not changed into the human, and the human is not transformed into the, divine, into the divine. And the divine and the human aren't somehow mixed together to form some sort of a third entity. Jesus is not a hybrid. He's not a Prius, okay? It's not, it's not that kind of thing. The two natures are not, they said, mixed with one another. And this sort of thinking happens all the time. If you think about it in terms of electricity, and I don't know a lot about electricity, you know, they have the AC and the DC, and no, Sean, I'm not talking about the rock band, AC, DC. We're talking about currents here, you know, and some people act as if, uh, oh, when this happened, that's Jesus was acting in his divine nature, and then boom, oh, when that happened, he was acting in his human nature, as if he flips a switch between the two currents. He doesn't do that. He never does that. Packer says Jesus lived his divine and human life in and through his human mind and body at every point. He did and endured everything, including his suffering on the cross, in the unity of his divine and human person. Now, if you go through all that, you're like me. You go, 
Sometimes I think I understand this, and then I'm standing here right now, I'm going, I'm not sure if I understand this, okay? I'm being honest with you. But I am greatly helped when I read the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and he exclaims there, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery, the mystery of godliness. And then there's a big colon there, and he says, he was manifested in the flesh. That's Paul saying it's a mystery to him. He's bowing down before the mysterious nature of that which is made so perfectly plain in the scriptures, of that which is so vitally important when we come to a text like this. Okay? And why is it important? Because in our day and age we live, that, that we live in, there are a few of us that are upset or disturbed by a Christ that is less than divine. Few of us are upset about that. People even run to religions that have Christ that are less than divine these days because they can't wrap their mind around that. Uh, but some of us may be guilty of, ha guilty of having a less than human Christ. And because we are faulty on the humanity of Christ, how do we come to a passage like this? We can't interpret it. Shouldn't he have known? He knows this is happening, so why isn't he calm? Well, he uh, and if he doesn't know what's happening, why is he so upset? And then around and around your mind goes. How can God in Christ be so perfectly prepared from all eternity, so clear in his approach for what now awaits him? How does he crumble in the face of it? What happens? But we must take the scripture as it is. Verse 33, the words are strong. Peter, James, and John go with him. And we are told there he was greatly distressed. He's greatly troubled. Distress signifies someone that is in a shuddering horror is what it means in the, in the Greek. And the word translated trouble could easily be translated as anguish, the Greek scholars tell us. It's an anguish from which he cannot escape. It's an anguish when he, in which he has no help. They're sleeping. He has no comfort. Then Jesus says to the disciples, my soul is sorrowful unto death. Watch him pray. Don't nap and snooze. Watch him pray. But what do they do? They nap and they snooze. So what we have here, I think, is Jesus in his perfect humanity swallowed up by the emotion of everything that's before him. Peterson, in his paraphrase, I think it's called The Message, in his pa paraphrase says that Jesus is plunged into a sinkhole of dreadful agony. A sinkhole of dreadful agony. Now think about it. Think about what the Gospels tell us. We know that it's cold. It's a cold evening. Because what is Peter doing when he's denying? He's standing by a fire in the courtyard of the high priest. So it's cold enough that evening to have a fire so on a night that's that cold, uh, Luke tells us with the observation of a physician, Luke was a physician, he tells us that the agony of the experience was so great that Jesus' sweat appeared like drops of blood, appeared like drops of blood. The capillaries in his forehead actually burst from the strain. They burst from the strain. If we learn anything from this, we learn that Jesus was a flesh and blood human being just like you and me. And that's why he sought to remove himself. He knew what was going on with the crucifixion when somebody was crucified. He knew the humiliation. He knew the suffering. He knew the horror. If you've ever seen the movie The Passion of the Christ, I watched it and I wanted to hide my eyes from what happened in that movie. The horror of it all. The brutality. The cruelty behind a crucifixion and there was nothing in Christ that would keep him from experiencing all of these emotions that would come at a time like this he faced them to their fullest extent he felt them with the entirety of his being John uh, Mark 10 45 tells us that he came to give his life as a ransom for many and I think here in Gethsemane he makes the first installment on the payment of that ransom to will to become the sin bearer for his people. Here in Gethsemane, he surrenders to the terrible agony. He surrenders 
to the terrible agony that's in front of him. It's one thing, as fearful as it would be, for you and I to stand before a holy God and answer for our own sins. That would be horrible to stand before God and answer for our sins on our own. But who here among us can imagine what it would be like to stand before God and answer for every crime, every hateful word, every act of malice, every injury, every evil in the entire world for every person? That's what Jesus is facing. Amen. That's what he is facing. Verse 35, and going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed if it were possible that this cup might pass from him. As we've gone through Mark's gospel, we've seen people running up to Jesus and falling on their face, some of them praising him and thanking them for healing, some of them asking for healing, and all of these situations. Peter and James and John fell on their face uh, up on the Mount of Transfiguration when God the Father spoke from heaven. This is the only time, however, in all of Scripture that we find Jesus prostrating himself in humility before God the Father. And he's, he lay face down on the ground. He says, he prays, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Here again, we see Jesus' nature. He staggers under the weight of what's in front of him. Father, is there any way? Any way we, other way we can do this? Is there any possible way that this cup can pass? And this isn't some sort of detached prayer. Jesus is not indifferent to his circumstances here. He's not sitting there enveloped in some envelope of peace or, and, and saying all of this is, is good. Uh, there is an interplay here between the heart of Jesus Christ and the will of the Father. Jesus' prayer does not rise from some sort of calm resignation. Instead, it comes from the frightening reality of God's will and what it will mean for him to surrender to it. And the fundamental humanity of the prayer, I think, is seen when Jesus says, take this cup from me. Take it away from me. I don't want to face this. He's not talking about a cup of sadness and sorrow and distress. And the image of the cup, as found in the Old Testament, is the, is the cup of God's wrath. That's what we spoke of before, the cup of God's wrath. God's judgment upon sin was being set before the Son of God. Father, is there another way? I'll go to the cross. I'll lay down my life. I'll pour out my blood. I can handle the cross and the wrath of the Romans, the wrath of the religious leaders, uh, against. Uh, but to have to face your unmingled, unmitigated wrath, Father, against sin. Do I have to experience that? Do I have to go through you turning your face away from me? But he's not finished praying yet. He ended with, yet not what I will, but what you will. Everything in his human nature wanted to run from the cup of God's wrath. He didn't want to drink it. But there would be uh, one thing that was even worse, and that would be to fail to do God's will. If it's your will, Lord, I'll drink this cup. If there's no other way, then give me the cup. I'll drink it to the last dregs. Then verses 39 through 41, Jesus is going back and forth between the place he's praying and the sleeping disciples. He's asking them to watch, but instead they sleep. Despite seeing the obvious distress, I mean, he comes back, the capillaries on his head had burst. He's got blood running down his cheeks. They sleep. They sleep. He's sorrowful, even unto death. And this happens three times. Makes me wonder, Peter, is this a prelude to your three denials that are coming? Is it? He comes to him this time again. He calls Peter by his old name, Simon. Simon. Remember last week we talked about it. Jesus had given him a new name, Peter, rock, that you're rocky. Simon meant shaky. So he's saying, you know, oh, okay, shaky, here you go. You told me that you would never leave me. You'd never forsake me. And here I am, and I need you now. Shaky, you're sleeping when you should be watching and praying. Let's not be too critical because we're like him, aren't we? 
The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's a reminder for us all, namely that trusting and obeying God, they're not the default response of Christians, are they? It's not our default response. There's that ongoing struggle between temptation and, and weakness. We like, we're like Peter, we get shaky. We get shaky from time to time. So what do we need to do? We need to follow Jesus' prescription. Watch and pray. Watch yourself by being in the Word. Pray and be in relationship to your Father. Watch and pray. Jesus' final words here is, it's enough. It's enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go, be going. My betrayer is at hand. With that statement, the first event in Jesus' predictions regarding his passion comes to pass. He goes willingly. And this one disciple draws a sword and he's got bad aim. He goes for the head and whacks off somebody's ear. You know, then Jesus tells him to put it away. Peter, and, and they go willingly. Jesus goes willingly. He doesn't put up a fight. He surrenders. He surrenders. Now, the big question here is, what's the takeaway? So what, preacher? You've spent the last, I don't know, 20 minutes talking about this. What's, what's the takeaway here? You know, Jesus struggles in his humanity. But in the end, he surrenders to the Father's will. We all knew that's what was going to happen. So why are you so up in the air about all this theological stuff? If that's the way we're thinking, it reveals we're just too familiar with this stuff. We're too familiar with the story to see the freshness of it and the reality of it. We know this is what Jesus does. So we take it for granted. We take it for granted. But what if Jesus refused to drink the cup? What then? There would be no salvation. We would have to drink the cup of God's wrath ourselves. We would be left there to do it and to do that and face the Lord of glory. Unless Jesus surrenders his soul in Gethsemane, he doesn't surrender his body on Calvary. And surrender, I think, is the key for every one of us. I've heard people over the years say to me, and I've probably said it myself, I'm committed to the cause of Christ. I am committed. And that's wonderful, and I know what they mean, and I'm not trying to belittle anybody who says that because it's a good thing. But as I've studied the passage this week, I've come to see that being a Christian is more about surrender than it is about commitment. Amen. It's more about surrender than it is about commitment. Commitment, as defined in the Oxford English Dictionary, means this. Commitment is giving oneself over to a particular course of conduct. You give yourself over to a particular course of conduct. So if you're a committed Christian, you're going to act like a Christian and conduct yourself like a Christian. You're going to behave that way. You're going to follow the rules. You're going to do everything. Who does that sound like? It sounds like the Pharisees, doesn't it? That's what they were going to do. They were going to follow all the rules. And how did they do it? They did it in their own power, and they did it in their own strength, and they did it their own way. I'm going to get up tomorrow morning, and I'm going to be a good Christian. I'm going to pull up uh, my britches, and I'm going to cinch on the belt really hard, and by golly, I'm going to do this. Surrender, again, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, is this, the giving up of oneself to the power and possession of another who has a claim to it. The giving up of oneself to the power and possession of another who has a claim to it. Commitment is our own power. Surrender is the power of Christ. I think you can be committed and not saved. You can be committed to the cause of Christ and not saved. 
You can try to live this Christian life under your own steam and never be saved. The only way you can be truly committed is to surrender. Amen. You have to surrender first, and then the commitment comes. And the commitment comes out of love and out of grace. Have you ever surrendered? Have you ever surrendered over to the power and possession of Christ? Have you ever did what Jesus did in Gethsemane and surrendered to God? He has a prior claim on you. One of the definitions in the dictionary was is it's about property. And, if you did, it's, and you see it all the time. If you don't pay for your property, you have to surrender it. We belong to God. We've been purchased by the blood of his son. We are to surrender ourselves up to him. I guess I've had surgery on my mind a lot this week because before every surgery that I've ever had, and I've had a lot <laughs> over the past couple of years, I think it's somewhere over a dozen, but before every one of them, I had to sign a document. And the document was that you understood what they were going to do to you and how they were going to do it and you agreed to it, and of course it's to keep them from medical malpractice, blah, 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 blah. But you sign the document. That's commitment. I've committed myself to him. But, and I'll be honest with you, I've thought this, you know, I can take out this IV, I can put on my clothes, and I can get out of here before this happens. I haven't surrendered yet. <laughs> I haven't given up on this yet. But for me to underdo, undergo the surgery, what did I have to do? I had to give myself over to the surgeon. I had to surrender myself to him and trust myself to him, put my faith in him. Without surrender, my surrender, there would never be a surgery. And I wonder, have you ever surrendered yourself to the great physician? Have you ever surrendered yourself to the great physician? Have you ever placed yourself in his hands? Will you do that? Place your faith in him and your trust in him. I implore you this morning on behalf of Jesus Christ. Be reconciled to God. Surrender to the one who drank the cup of God's wrath to the very last drop so that you wouldn't have to. Lord, we thank you, we praise you for your great grace. We thank you for the surrender, uh, for your surrender in the garden, for your surrender to go to Calvary. And Lord, I just pray that we would all surrender our lives to you. And after that surrender, we would commit our lives to you out of love and grace. In your name we pray, amen. Every sinful